Next, from Chicago, Dr. Helene Gale, the president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, is interviewed by Judy Sue of ABC7 Chicago about philanthropic efforts improving Chicago. This runs about 45 minutes. There was only one thing Ed left out of my introduction, which is, for those of you who are longtime ABC7 watchers, I was also the news anchor who had the baby on the expressway. <laughs> that was, so I don't just cover breaking news. I didn't even tell you Dr. Gale it. that. Yes. You know, we, well, I made breaking news that morning. It was 4 o'clock in the morning on the way to, anyway, never made it. So that's me. It's lovely to be, <laughs> it's lovely to be with all of you today and great to be on stage with Dr. Gale. Um, Dr. Gale and I actually had a long format sit down interview soon after she came to Chicago to head on the, the Chicago Community Trust. So it's great to learn about her passion and I'm so excited to share what you had to offer to everybody here today. Um, but I think the biggest question that may be on everybody's mind is given our beautiful day here, how was is, how is your first winter here in Chicago? Well, um, actually, this has been a pretty mild winter. You know, and uh, when I first said I was moving to Chicago, all of my friends were laughing. Um, you know, I'd lived in Washington, D.C. for a long time. I lived in Atlanta for many, many years. And um, everybody was laughing about me moving to Chicago. I've always said, I, you know, I'm from Buffalo, New York, originally. And I, I, know, always, right? I, I always said, I am never, ever going back to cold climate again. Um, and my husband, who's here, who's from Chicago, said he was never going back to cold climate or Chicago again himself. So you never say never. Anyway, best advice I got, buy a warm coat. I did. Um, live close to your office, I do. <laughs> as a result of that, this has been a pretty mild winter. And the other thing is when I talk to, again, when I talk to my friends from all around the country, this weather isn't particularly good anywhere. This has not been a good winter. I keep getting stuck every time I go to New York City because of snowstorms. Uh, we might want to get into climate change, whole other issue. Um, but uh, clearly, weather patterns are not what they used to be. So weather aside, clearly not the biggest draw for people to move to Chicago. What drew you, though, to the Chicago Community Trust? Because as we heard in your background, it's uh, mainly globally focused. For a long time, you travel the world, and now you're here in Chicago. What drew you to one of the largest and oldest foundations, the second oldest in the country? Well, I could blame that woman right there, Sheila Grady, um, who headed the search um, that uh, brought me. And thank you, <laughs> Sheila. Um, but you know, I, I guess um, everybody's life has some so sort of arc. And in retrospect, sometimes it, it seems like it's well planned and, and makes a lot of sense. Um, but usually, it's a, some mix of opportunity, um, timeliness, readiness and some of those sort of things. So, you know, I started my career out as a, as a physician, and I, I did that because I wanted to have a very practical skill that could make a difference in people's lives. And so um, I also knew, though, that, uh, and, and some of this came from my time as a pediatrician, that I continued to see things that made me realize that just focusing on individuals was not really going to make the kind of change that I wanted to make. Because you saw, I was a, I'm a pediatrician, I would see children come in and out of the hospital, in and out of emergency room, in and out of clinics. And a lot of times, the factors that led to that were more societal and, and social factors. And so I really started thinking about how could I take medicine, the practice of medicine, and take it from an individual level to a population level. That led me to thinking more about public health. I got a degree in public health, went to the Centers for Disease Control for a couple of years uh, in a training program, thinking I'd stay two years, stayed 20. Mm -hmm. um, as I realized um, how important some of the work that CDC was doing. But I got very involved, as was mentioned in the um, introduction, in the HIV epidemic. Yeah. And um, you know, for anybody who's been involved with HIV, you know, yes, it is, a, it is an infectious, infectious disease. Anybody can get it. But at the end of the day, it is not randomly distributed. And in some ways, HIV, like so many other uh, illnesses that we have, really um, show our societal fault lines, because people who were disproportionately impacted by HIV were often poor, 
um, discriminated against because of sexual orientation, people of color, uh, et cetera. So people who were poor or marginalized, stigmatized, were more likely. And so you know, looking at some of these societal issues in this country that were all about inequity, I started getting very involved also in the global HIV epidemic. Okay. And some of those same sort of societal factors are what undergirds risk for HIV globally, just like it does here. Um, and as I kept searching for, how do you not look just at Band-Aids and, and fix, short, quick fixes, but how do you actually look at the underlying root causes? I got much more engaged in looking not just at health, because in the health box, in the health toolkit, you can only do but so much. But if you really want to have an impact on health and health inequity, whether it's HIV or anything else, you've got to look at housing. You have to look at transportation, education, economic opportunities. And so those were the very things that led me to CARE, where we worked in 80-some countries around the world with some of the poorest communities, looking at how do you develop long-term strategies to address these root causes of poverty. Um, so, you know, I, I had kind of gone from individual medicine to looking at population medicine and population health to thinking about what were the underlying causes that led to inequities in health, both in this country and then around the world. And I think for me, um, you know, again, we think about our lives and stages. Um, what brought me into a lot of what I was doing to the be very beginning was the inequities that we have here in this country. Growing up as an African-American woman um, in the 60s, early 70s, you know, I saw a lot of things that were very troubling and disturbing. And the uh, minister talked about uh, the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. I you know, was a, a young teenager at that time, and I saw the kinds of things that happened to cities um, and saw the you know, bleak despair that, that uh, so many communities face. And so you know, that was where I started. And when I had this opportunity to think about coming to a city like Chicago that has real entrenched challenges, but also one of the most engaged civic communities that I've ever seen in any of the cities I've been in, where I think there's an incredible love of this city. There's an incredible sense of goodwill and wanting to do things. Uh, so I thought the combination of this venerable organization, 102 years old, well-trusted, uh, relatively um, well endowed um, with this city that has incredible goodwill and a reach in neighborhoods and experience in neighborhoods where there's been huge disinvestment that I thought that was a potential for doing some really important things. And I also, having spent so much of my time globally, so much of my career globally, um, this last few years has also shaken me a lot. What's happening here in our own country? And I think that we're at risk as a nation of losing the role that America has played in the world. And that if we don't get our own house straight, um, I think we're going to have some real challenges um, for our place in the world and the important place that America uh, plays for the rest of the world. So I think by getting our own house in order, we're not only doing it for ourselves, but I think we're doing it for the world. And I think the moral authority that America has always had has to be re rebuilt. And some of that is around how do we address some of these um, intractable, what seemingly intractable inequities that exist here and um, in other places around the country. You, you mentioned the challenges. Long answer to you. Well, yeah, no, that's okay. See, oh, well, we're, yeah. not, we're not on television, so I don't get the rap from my producer in my ear, which is what we usually get. Um, but, but you mentioned the challenges that our city faces um, in our country. At, I, I know you had said when you first came here that you have no concrete plans or a set of plans when it comes to the direction of the trust. You've been here for about six months now. You've been sort of on a listening tour with the donors and the grantees. What, what are you hearing about the challenges that we are facing going forward as a city? Yeah, and let me just say, I, I did have ideas. Um, uh, but what I, what I didn't want to do as somebody who was coming into a new city and a new organization, come in with my own agenda. I wanted that to be informed by the people who were closest to the issues, for the people who know this city better, to the incredible staff that I have the honor and pleasure of working with who really know communities. Um, 
And so I wanted my thinking to be informed, and I thought that it was a good opportunity with a new leader for us as an organization to step back and to really think about where can this organization that, again, has all the, these incredible assets um, really make a bigger difference. And I think, like so many organizations that have, you know, we're a community foundation. We, we exist to serve the Chicago region and to be a good partner. But I think, as in so many organizations, it's easy to become all things to all people. Yeah. And, you know, I could, I could read a list of the incredible things that this organization has done. And, and yes, it has done many things. But I think there's an opportunity to actually be more focused about what we do and perhaps have longer, more sustainable impact on a few things and do those well. So, you know, I have been listening and learning. Um, you know, I spent a lot of my first six months just talking to lots of people. There are a lot of people in this room who I've had conversations with to get people's perspectives. You know, I'm now doing a lot more of getting out and seeing things on the ground. I want to really see what are, what are people who are living the experiences on a day-to-day -day basis of grinding poverty, of lack of resources, of inadequate education. What are they saying about it? And what are their concerns? And I think, you know, we come back to, uh, and what, you know, one of the forums we have is on the table, and many of you have probably been involved with on the table. We'll be doing that in another, in another month. Um, you know, year after year, we get a lot of, we talk broadly to broad range of communities, and we get a lot of the same answers back. People are concerned about public safety, they're concerned about getting jobs, they're concerned about education, and they're concerned about the racial tension that exists in this um, city and the extreme segregation. And so, you know, I think there's a whole range of issues that we could focus on. Or we could step back and say, if we want to have an impact on something, what are the uh, integrated set of activities that make a difference to be able to, to, to move the needle on something, So for, to, to be concrete? So for example, um, you know, it's widely known that if you go five miles in any direction from the loop, you can get a 15 to 20 year gap in life expectancy. So if you live in the loop, uh, if, you know, if you live in the um, northern uh, part of the city, your life expectancy is somewhere between 85, 87. But if you go five miles away in some of the poor, disinvested communities, your life expectancy is closer to 65, 67. So you know, in this city, like so many, but particularly the city, zip code is destiny. And if you want to have an impact on the health, that health gap, it's not going to be just because you get people in to see doctors more often. Mm -hmm. It's going to be because you have grocery stores that, that sell a high quality of food. It's going to be that you have access to education, uh, transportation that allows you to get to a job and, and keep a job. Um, you know, it's, it, it is whether or not your streets are safe to walk down. So, you know, I think any issue that we take means that we'll have to enter it in a variety of different ways. So that, that's kind of what I, I think we will be looking at. Where are there some things where there's not exactly white space, but where we as, as the Chicago Community Trust and the assets that we have as, as, a, as a funder, um, as a convener, as a trusted voice, um, in the community, where can we put those assets to best use and how can we do that in a way that really understands how people live their lives because we don't live our lives in sectors. And it's interesting, Dr. Gale mentioned, and that was an insightful study about the gap in the life expectancy. If you all are interested, you should look it up because oftentimes when we first hear those numbers, we think, well, violence is the, the reason. And when you look at it, that's not the that's only not reason. That's not the only reason. Yeah. It's, a, it's a reason, and we know it's uh, still the leading cause of death for African American and um, Latino young men in, you know, in the um, adolescent and early age group um, age range, but it's not the reason for the, for the gap. Um, and it's, 
that whole broad range of other things. I have to ask you about um, just the core mission of uh, the Chicago Community Trust. Perhaps all of you in this room understand what the trust does, but by and large, a lot of people, you know, when you do news stories about the trust, when I first came back to Chicago, so I grew up, I went from Chinatown to Rogers Park to Morton Grove, went to U of I. When I came back to take this job at Channel 7 15, 16 years ago now, and, we, and I first did a story about the trust, I had no idea about the, the reach of the trust. Do you find that still today, that the community still kind of doesn't completely grasp what the trust does? Yeah, I think it's, it, that's fair. It's part of why I think we want to be more focused so that we're able to tell our story better, not for the sake of telling a story, but because I think it does help to focus your, your efforts and focus who you partner with and how you, and how you operate. But you know, the, the trust is different things to different people. For many people, it is where they it are able to express their philanthropy. Um, you know, we have uh, over a hundred, uh, over a thousand, uh, about fifteen hundred donor advised funds um, where people are able to uh, work with the trust to express their philanthropic desires. We also serve as a grantee, and particularly a grantee for the nonprofit sector. One of the things that we try to do is to build a strong, healthy nonprofit sector because we know that um, those, uh, particularly the community based organizations, are really important resources for communities. They provide services, but they do more than provide services, they are anchor institutions in many ways. In those, in those communities. So we, we are a grantor. We also raise funds. Uh, we work with donors. We hope that we're a good source for people who are interested in making a difference here in Chicago. Think of us as the place where they can get good advice about where can their resources best be used. So, you know, w as I said, we're also a convener. We also do a lot in the area of, of civic engagement through things like On the Table and other activities. So we are a lot of things, yeah. um, and I think that's, again, part of the reason why we're so excited about bringing this all together in a way that can be perhaps more focused, and we can tell our story in perhaps an even more coherent way with the ability to talk about our impact very clearly. And you do have tremendous impact. I was reading, I think, last year alone, the trust granted out funds to, what, 11,000 nonprofits right. in the city and the suburbs. I mean, that's a phenomenal number. It is, and I think it, you know it does. It speaks to the fact that those organizations are so important to the civic life of this community. I got to ask you also, you know, as we go forward, and you look at, you have clearly a wonderful working relationship with your existing donors, longtime major donors. Um, as you look forward to that next generation of inc inspiring them for civic engagement and philanthropy, how do we enter that space and make that work? Yeah, and I, I, it's a great question because to, today's um, or the next generation of philanthropists are not necessarily the same as, as today's generation. And we do a lot with young professional advisors, for instance, who are working with younger clients. But you know, one of the best examples is um, our, our collaboration with the Ciro family. The Ciro family, people know um, Ciro Pharmaceutical, John, John Ciro, um, who started the pharmaceutical company. And that family was, um, are, and still is, one of the most important um, um, contributors and, and, and uh, donors to the trust. And we've now worked with multiple generations of that family. And I think uh, we have um, the Kinship um, Foundation that uh, works with the Cerro family is represented here by Renee Michael. Um, you know, it's a wonderful collaboration, and it's, it's the kind, it's the way in which I think we want to do more of our philanthropy. This is not, here, here's, here's money, uh, this is what we want to do with it. Let's talk about this together. Let's develop, let's co-create programs. So we have this wonderful program that we're doing with the Ciro family called Food Land Opportunity that really looks at the fact that we have this high uh, demand for agricultural products here, but we're not really um, utilizing local production. And so it's a way of really looking at there's a, de there's a demand and how do we actually look at that supply so that we're making sure that more local and regional production um, goes to serve the demand of people here in, in this region. So, you know, I think it's, it's been a wonderful collaboration. 
And now we're working with the next generation of the Ciro family uh, who are incredibly excited about continuing this legacy that, that has been so long with the Ciro family and the trust. And I could give other examples, but that's perhaps the best one because it's one of the longest collaborations we've had and it's been fabulous. You've also had an experience, I know the last um, few months, to tour some of the nonprofits that you have granted uh, funds out to. Anything that stands out in your mind right now? Well, I, I'll, because I was just there, the two that stand out in my mind, it's actually from a project uh, called Benefit Chicago, and people may have heard of Benefit Chicago. It's a new way that we're doing work. This is impact investing. So we're actually giving loans, not grants, to organizations who might be a bit um, higher risk, who might not be able to qualify for traditional capital. And so we're giving loans, $500,000 um, and, and above, to businesses that are able to show that they've got a good and strong business plan and also a social mission. So the two that I just went to, um, and Will Towns here is the executive director of uh, Benefit Chicago, so it's on my mind. Uh, we went to one um, called Sweet Beginnings. Yeah, and uh, on yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful uh, organization that is um, teaching primarily people who have been in the, in the criminal justice system how to grow bees and then to make honey that is sold, a, a, a very high grade of um, raw, unprocessed honey, and then also to use honey in beauty products. So there's body lotions and body scrubs and, you know, and these are now, you can go into Mariano's and Whole Foods and buy these. And to go there and see these, and the, the program is fabulous because it's part of a broader uh, program, the North, North Lawndale Employment Network, where they are able to take uh, people who are re-entering um, and give them skills. And there, I think, if I remember the statistics correctly, you know, where recidivism is about 55% in uh, Illinois, they have a less than 4% recidivism rate because wow. of these programs. Yeah. Wow. You know, when you, when you talk to somebody who has the dignity that having a job yeah. does for them and that they can then go to a Mariano's and see the, their produce on the shelf. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. The other one was um, Garfield Produce, which also an uh, incredible story of uh, a couple um, who were very dedicated to doing what they could in the, in the Garfield area getting jobs, and again, oftentimes people who are hard to employ um, because of uh, criminal backgrounds. And they decided, they were thinking of a lot of things, but got uh, decided to, to do urban farming hmm. and found um, an incredible young man who is the manager and um, the, the loan that we were able to give them was used to upgrade their facility because they had a pretty old facility that wasn't produ production um, grade level. And they're now going to be producing, I think he told me something like 100 pounds of microgreens a wow. week, which will allow them to now send that. And I think if I remember the numbers right, it was something like on the order of a quarter million dollars of sales uh, in revenue that's not uh, uh, net, but, but still, I mean, a really thriving business um, urban farming, and they're, again, employing people who would have otherwise been close to unemployable. And so those are the kinds of stories, and to be able to give loans and the rigor with which they have developed their business plans so that you know that this is going to be a sustainable business, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. And to your point about the next generation philanthropists, you know, part of the reason we're so excited about impact investing is that that's an area that a lot of more young people, they're really interested yes. in, they're first in impact, but they're also interested in not just giving grants and keeping people in this grant cycle, but how do you actually help people build businesses that then lead to a sustainable, uh, a much more sustainable business model where you're not having to constantly write grants and it adds a different dignity when you're talking about actually creating jobs as well. So it's, 
Doesn't get much better than that. That sweet <laughs> beginnings. If you guys have not tried yeah. that honey, Dr. Gale is right. It is really good. You gotta look for it. The I'm honey Michelle. is good. The lotion yeah. is, is great. The body scrub. Oh, check it out. <laughs> Anybody need good. presents for their wives or their husbands or whoever, you know? Anyway, it's great. You're right, the dignity part you can't be. We've done stories on Sweet Beginnings and when you see it in their faces, that their products and what they have worked so hard for, something that they never thought could be possible, you know, maybe a right. few months earlier, now they're doing it. That brings us sort of to on the table. That is something I hope all of you participate in, but when we first heard about it, what a phenomenal, concept. Just tell us a little bit more about that. You're about to launch into it again. How has those conversations, do you think, changed the trust and what the trust, you know, is, is going to do? Yeah, so I'm going to participate in my first on the table this year. Um, this is the fifth year, and I'm really, really looking yeah. forward to it. Because, I, you know, what I hear from people is that having this day um, that is dedicated to having essentially tough conversations yeah. allows people to have conversations that they might not have had otherwise. And it gives communities that had not um, necessarily interacted with each other the opportunity to interact mm -hmm. and open up subjects that, that are difficult. And out of it, you know, this year we really want to put a big focus on action and doing uh, and taking action. You know, it's been great to have the conversations. And I think in any time social change, you got to start with people talking openly and honestly about issues. But there's a point at which talk, um, doesn't necessarily keep you moving towards action. So this, you know, we're going to put a big a focus this year on doing, um, trying to support people in their efforts to actually come out with tangible, concrete actions, and you know, hopefully be able to come out of that with a set of some maybe really creative, innovative ways in which uh, people can practice social change in their communities. I got to ask you something. We mentioned in the introduction that um, Dr. Gale was named by Forbes magazine as mm -hmm. one of the 100 most powerful women. Um, but I hope all of you also know that in the Trust 102 year history, she now is the first woman to lead the Trust. I'm sure everybody wants to know, I know I want to know, did that factor at all into your decision to come here to take this job? What did you think when you knew that you were going to be the first woman to lead this position? Well, more than that, um, I'm the first woman to lead in 102 years. And I, when I divided up seven by 102 and knew what age I was, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I hope they don't expect me for 25 years. <laughs> um, but no, you know, um, you know, I've been, I've been the first. I, I look forward to the day when um, being a woman or being African American is not that unusual. Uh, that it is not a first. That said, I take it very seriously. Um, I think that you know, I am a product of who I am and how the world has interacted with me. And and I think that you know, it is important that I bring my whole self to the job. Uh, part of that is being a woman. I think it's also important that for uh, young women and little girls that they can look up and see somebody that looks like them and that that gives them more hope and courage and um, sense of what the possible is. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's a, important and I um, care, don't, don't treat it lightly. <laughs> Well, we are glad yeah. you are here. But before we wrap up here, we do have a beautiful video that we want to share with everybody about on the table that we talked about. So take a look at this video. We'll come back with some questions. Ideas can come from anywhere. Next to salads, on the other side of coffee cups, in restaurants, kitchens, dining rooms, and boardrooms. It doesn't matter where the idea comes from or who it comes from. What matters is what are you going to do with it. On the table, be a host or a guest, then move ideas from tables to community. Take action, change something, meet, share, do. Put your good ideas into action. And that truly is what it's all about, putting it all into action and encouraging that next generation to, to get involved. Well, hello there. Hi, Jude. Uh, anger can be an important driver of action. 
What are you most angry about in Chicago? And how does and where how and where does the trust mission compel action? Well, I first I hope our mission, which is to uh, broadly speaking um, make uh, the Chicago region vibrant, productive, and and uh, prosperous. You know, I hope that overall um, that spurs us to action. But I guess when I think about what I'm the most angry about. Um, you know, I spent uh, Saturday doing a tour of the South Side, and earlier uh, in the week I was uh, on the West Side, and um, earlier in the week before that uh, in Little Village. And I, it, and I live downtown. I'm two blocks from my office, um, keeping it real simple. Um, and you know, I'm in this incredible, beautiful city with gleaming buildings. Uh, and what I'm incredibly angry about is that when I go to some of these neighborhoods that still, after 50 years, still look like bombed out um, communities where there's been a total lack of disinvestment and a total lack of compassion for um, many of the citizens who, who live in those, in, in those uh, parts of town. I just think that that kind of gross neglect, lack of development, lack of investment is just unacceptable. And so it's hard for me to realize, and again, I think back, you know, it's 50 years since the Kerner Report was re first um, uh, put out, and there was a report from the, I think, one of the remaining commissioners mm -hmm. from that report, Fred Harris, um, who wrote a book basically saying, you know, nothing has changed in that 50 mm -hmm. years since the Kerner Report, which said we're moving to two societies, one white, one black, separate but unequal. And, you know, to, to look up 50 years and see that that's still the case. Now we, I guess in Chicago, would say there's a tale of three cities if you think of the Latino population, but it's just unex unexcusable. And so, you know, um, I think I don't want to, well, I probably won't wake up 50 years from now, but, um, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want the legacy to be that 50 years from now we're saying the same thing in this city, in Chicago, or any other place in the country. What do you see as our civic community's responsibility in supporting healthy, successful reinsertion of our incarcerated mm -hmm. populations? Yeah, and I'm sure there are many, many people here who know a lot more about the criminal justice system here and what are some of the best policy remedies. You know, I think first and foremost, it's always, uh, you know, I think it starts with caring. Um, second, it starts with knowing, you know, being uh, aware of what can be done, and then and then doing. And so I think um, it, it, it's it's clearly a huge issue, and one where um, you know there's lots of clear sense of what some of the policies could be that make a difference. But at, you know, just as I was talking about um, uh, the health disparity and the, and the kinds of ways in which you have to think about integrated programs. I don't think there's any one answer or magic bullet. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably the thing that I think we get wrong the most is that if it's a criminal justice issue, we think it's all, let's only talk to the people in criminal justice and that's where we're going to find the answers. I think it's when we start having more of this crosstalk between people who bring different pieces of the solution to the table and when we start bringing different sectors, because I do believe that we've oftentimes let the private sector off the hook too much. I think there's so much that um, the private industry, businesses are starting to do and can do more. And so I think, you know, we always think social, social sector uh, issues should only be solved by the nonprofit sector. Well, I think that's putting an undue burden on one sector to solve all the problems. So I think we need government, we need the not-for-profit sector, we need business, and we need everybody working together in a way that brings what they have to the table. And so, you know, it's not a specific about, so, uh, about criminal justice, but I do think it's that how do we get people who bring different pieces of the puzzle together to come up with the really comprehensive solutions. 
Thank you. Uh, this question is from Pastor Martin. Um, Dr. Gale, how do you see the very diverse religious communities assisting your vision for the trust? Yeah, good question. I, you know, I, I think that faith communities have such an important role to play because so much of this is also how do you change community norms and how do you change people's ways of thinking about what's, what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, uh, what values, because you know, at the core of this, this is really about values and how do we value each other, how do we value our communities. And you know, uh, faith communities are the ones who are so much a part of helping to shape our norms um, and, uh, and our, our cultural values. So I, I would love to think about ways in which we can have perhaps even more engaged um, relationships with our diverse faith communities. And I think it, you know, really the, diverse, the diversity of the faith communities here that I think have so much to offer as well. Your point about America needing to reestablish its moral authority in order to lead the world in reducing social inequities is well taken. Can U.S. civil society rebuild our standing in the world without consistent leadership from the White House? Oh. <laughs> this is the city club. We allow sandbagging. You know, part of why I, I was so excited about coming and working at the local level in a community, in a city, is that I think that a lot of innovation is going to come um, from our cities. And I, I do think that you know, this is a, a time where we've got a lot of noise going on um, at, at the national level. But I think that's not an excuse for not being able to, where we are, start thinking about what are the kernels of social change that can actually make a difference, but that can ripple, can be a ripple effect for the whole nation. So I think you know, in times where there's perhaps not the kind of leadership that we might want at the national level, I think that's the time when we take the leadership here and really come up with real tangible, creative solutions. Thank you. I have two last questions, Dr. Gale. This is from Lance Russell, who's with the Chicago Technical or Technological Academy. Uh, where are you, Mr. Russell? OK. Uh, foundations have directed most of their educational support towards quote unquote scalable programs that push into schools. Do you think the f trust can do more to directly sponsor schools, such as sponsor a school approach? You know, it's, it's an approach some have taken. I'm not sure that, um, you know, whether we'll go to a sponsor a school approach. You know, some, there's lots of ways of um, trying to create change. One is that you double down and be very intensive and, you know, in a few areas. Others are you take some, uh, a broader approach to scaling things that you know work. You know, again, we're in kind of a discovery phase where we're going to step back and think about, given who we are, what's the best way to do it. But, I, you know, I, I think there are some of these things where there is no wrong way. It's just what's the way that makes the biggest sense for your particular organization. Okay. And our final question. And then we'll get to our drawing and a few last remarks. This is from Ellie Foreman with Mesero Financial. Ellie, where are you? Right down there. Great. Thank you. This is not to get political. Everything's political, OK? <laughs> What's your personal pet project? If you could write a philanthropic check to one nonprofit or to benefit one issue, <laughs> what would it be and why? Everybody's going, me, 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 me. I know, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that I have a pet project. Um, you know, I'm still kind of scoping out the landscape. You know, I, I will say, as I mentioned before, I really do think some of these innovative approaches, particularly things that are building businesses, like the ones I mentioned, where we're actually investing capital, helping people start businesses, have a lot of um, uh, you know, resonance because I, when I was at CARE, we did a lot of work with social enterprises and, and saw that 
you know, you can take things that used to be grant funded that had a short life and would never be able to have the kind of long-term impact that's necessary. And if you can transfer those into actually being businesses, you know, they're, they're more sustainable. You're bringing in capital that then allows you to continue to improve, to, to enhance your business and grow your business. So I think that approach generally is a really good one. You know, I also um, uh, loved uh, seeing my colleague uh, Tony Irvin there, and um, Gary Slutkin was here earlier. You know, I think some of the work in, around violence that takes, it, takes a different approach, the healing, um, help he healing hurt people, uh, which is a trauma-informed approach that really looks at, you know, young people coming into trauma centers and then really thinking about a much more holistic way of looking not just at their physical, but also their emotional, uh, their psychological. You know, these are young people who have gone through tremendous stress and PTSD, and are we, are we paying attention to the whole person in a way? Or, or the cure violence approach that really looks at public health, uh, a public health approach to violence and takes it, you know, looks at some of the very things that uh, myself and Gary used to do when we were in HIV, where you look at the high risk populations, take an, uh, an epidemiologic approach, look at what the cultural norms are, look at who's at highest risk and really put your, concentrate your efforts there. So I think, you know, for me, it's not a particular project. It's how are we thinking about approaches that are innovative, that are much more integrated, and that are not designed just to put on Band-Aids, but are really thinking about how do you create and sustain change over a long time? Because, you know, the reason why a lot of these things haven't changed is because they are long-term problems, but we're trying to address them with short-term interventions. So I think we've got to have our interventions be commiserate with the problems. So you know, those are the kinds of things. And there's no one pet project or one check that I'll write. Let me, since that's the last question, <laughs> let, me just, let, me, let me just close by saying, first of all, um, Chicago has been the most welcoming city I have ever come to. And I just want to thank so many of you who are here in the audience and others who I've met who have extended such an incredibly warm welcome to me and to my husband who's returning after having not lived here in 40 years. Um, by the way, if anybody needs a gen gently used pediatrician, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's still trying to settle into work here. So, uh, um, I, I also, you know, just want, uh, as as the as the um, head of an organization, you oftentimes get an incredible amount of uh, congratulations for work that you know is built on the backs of so many people. I um, saw earlier one of my predecessors, Don Stewart, um, who was too... <laughs> he and his, his wife, Isabel, who have been friends. We were both in Atlanta uh, over different times. My incredible staff, I, you know, I walked into a uh, office where people didn't know who the new leader was going to be. They have welcomed me so graciously. It's an incredible staff. It's probably the most diverse um, and inclusive staff that I've ever worked with. So it is uh, a real privilege for me to work with those staff. And then finally, my executive committee or, their, or our board, um, who had enough faith in me to bring me on and have been incredibly supportive all along this uh, last six-month journey. So, you know, thank you, Chicago. Welcome. <laughs>